Is America's legacy in doubt? The world's most powerful nation happens to have been a stable democracy for most of the better part of two centuries. As the planet awakens to images of the first storming of the U.S. Capitol since the British did it in the War of 1812, there are those who will focus on security lapses. How did crowd control get so easily overwhelmed? There are those who will fixate on an outgoing U.S. president who earlier that day had egged on a mob and who later continued to send mixed messages, even while lawmakers were hunkering down. There may even be those who say it's all a bad dream, a fringe president whose fringe loyalists came to Washington for one last hurrah two weeks before Inauguration Day. But more than 74 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. How many still support him and his false claim of a stolen election? Where does it leave his party, his successor, and where does it leave the United States of America? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking how stable a democracy is it? And joining us uh, from Washington, correspondent uh, Kedavon Gorgistani, who is back on Capitol Hill. Uh, welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Across the Potomac uh, from Vienna, Virginia, former Republican Congressman Tom Davis. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. From New York City, Sherry Berman, professor of political science at Barnard College, the author of Democracy and Dictatorship in Europe, from the Ancien Régime to the Present Day. Welcome to the show. And we welcome back from Jacksonville, Florida, Yasha Monk, uh, political scientist, the author of Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. The hashtag is F24Debate. Four dead on Wednesday, including a protester shot during the riots. 68 arrests, most of those, though, for curfew violations. Overwhelmed indeed were Capitol Police when it happened. Erna Gunke has that story. The risk of violent protests ahead of the most contested presidential election in recent U.S. history was no secret. Yet despite advanced knowledge of Wednesday's demonstration, security protocols in the U.S. Capitol visibly failed. While U.S. lawmakers met for a joint session to certify Joe Biden's victory, thousands of pro-Trump rioters stormed Capitol Hill penetrating and even occupying the building under the watch of security officers. Local officials only declared the site secure after some four hours of chaos, though confusion remained. Uh, there was additional requests that came forward from the Capitol Police, and for us to truly understand the specifics behind their requests and how we would support the operations, a lot of questions were asked, a little bit of confusion. But uh, as we worked through it, uh, we ultimately made the determination about a half hour later to mobilize the entire D.C. National Guard. Prior to Wednesday's protest, the D.C. mayor had requested the deployment of National Guard members. But the additional forces were scheduled to be used for traffic control or crowd management. And many of them were neither armed nor wearing body armor. For critics, Wednesday's events demonstrate a clear double standard in how protests are managed. In stark contrast to Wednesday's events, images of anti-racism protests last summer show heavy police presence. On several occasions, military and riot police encircled sensitive locations across the U.S. Capitol, with barriers surrounding the White House erected ahead of protests in August. The National Guard even stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial at a demonstration against police brutality in June preventing protesters from amassing on the monument and stoking concerns those present were denied their constitutional right to peacefully assemble. Kedavon Korjistani, is it a fair comparison, the law enforcement during the Black Lives Matter protests and what we saw on Wednesday? 
Well, uh, yes, and at least uh, it is for a lot of people here in Washington, uh, D.C. And uh, I've uh, been here. I covered uh, those protests during the summer uh, at Black Lives Matter uh, Plaza. I was not there uh, that uh, infamous day when uh, the law enforcement uh, cleared uh, the area with uh, gas bombs, uh, beating uh, protesters and journalists uh, alike uh, just for Donald Trump to cross the street uh, to do that uh, photo op in front of uh, the church. And so a lot of people are asking the question, uh, yes, maybe Capitol Police uh, was overwhelmed uh, at the start of uh, that security uh, breach. But then uh, when those uh, reinforcements arrived, uh, we saw how they cleared the area, how they cleared the building. Uh, it was peaceful in a way. They uh, slowly, gradually managed to get all those people uh, out. We heard uh, that uh, so far there are 68 people who were arrested. Compare that to uh, June 1st, uh, one of uh, the three main days of protests here in Washington after the death of uh, George Floyd. Uh, there were uh, nearly 300 arrests that night alone. And so people are asking, uh, even if we put aside how this happened, how uh, we let so many people into uh, the Capitol. What about after? Why uh, were people uh, simply allowed to leave, to walk out of uh, the Capitol uh, without a single uh, problem? Why uh, could law enforcement maybe keep their calm and manage to control the situation uh, without uh, using their guns, without using violence? Why couldn't they do that uh, back uh, during uh, the summer? Or for those who think that they did the right thing back in the summer, why didn't they apply the same thing uh, here when we heard uh, reports that there were some people who were armed, there were people who were arrested who had uh, guns, and there were uh, pipe bombs that were found in the Capitol building. And so those questions, uh, I believe, are uh, very very fair because uh, there seems to be at least a, a double standard in how uh, law enforcement here in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, reacted to protests. And w while it was unfolding in real time on social media, Kedavan, we were seeing these images of some of the Capitol Police. Now, maybe they were isolated incidents. We don't know. Uh, letting, uh, letting the um, protesters through. Yes, it's uh, the images are uh, are very uh, shocking. They're uh, very uh, hard uh, to, to, to watch and to understand. Uh, the question is, uh, what really uh, happened? You could also, uh, we're not saying that uh, Capitol Police uh, were simply just letting people in, but you have to uh, remember that uh, the Capitol Police were completely outnumbered. You saw uh, images of uh, one uh, member of uh, the protection inside the Capitol building being chased by a mob of people up the stairs of uh, the Capitol all by himself as he was calling uh, for help. And uh, you could imagine uh, that he was alone in front of a mob. He had his hand on his gun, but he decided uh, not to use it. So you have these images of uh, this Capitol Police uh, trying to uh, get these people to back up, but being overwhelmed. And then you have some images of uh, some members of uh, Capitol Police seemingly at least not intervening. Maybe uh, they felt that they couldn't do anything else and that otherwise they would be in danger. We saw some law enforcement being injured uh, during the violence yesterday. Uh, but uh, this is why a lot of people, including uh, the mayor, Muriel Bowser, and several uh, lawmakers, including Republicans, are asking for a bipartisan investigation as to what exactly happened uh, with the security breach issue, that question of uh, who dropped the ball did someone drop the ball or was this simply uh, too many people uh, too quickly and not enough preparation? Tom Davis, did you see this coming? I don't think anybody saw the assault on the Capitol. And to compare it with what happened this summer is really apples and oranges. What happened this summer, of course, there had been riots across the country. In the District of Columbia, millions of dollars of property was destroyed. My own office building uh, was smashed in graffiti and was uh, not usable even a month later. Fires were set to buildings. Um, and so I think the police handled that appropriately at the time because there had been threats to violent people injured. One person was shot uh, yesterday by a Capitol Police officer. But we'd never seen an assault like this on the Capitol. And I think the uh, Capitol Police have responsible for that area right around the Capitol, the D District of Columbia Police and, and others uh, for around the city. And I just think they were taken by surprise. 
they had never seen anything like this before, and they got overwhelmed very quickly. And I think what has to happen is you have to bring these people to justice uh, uh, very, very quickly. And I don't give them, think you give them any leniency. This has to be a message. This can't happen again. Uh, but I think this was a one-off. I don't see this as a recurring event uh, in American society at this point. Yeah, w one of the most shared images is of a uh, protester uh, carrying a Confederate flag inside the Capitol. Um, we can perhaps show it. It's it's a, 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 a picture by AFP photographer Saul Law. Behind him, you see the portrait of 19th century Senator Charles Sumner, a leader of the anti-slavery movement in Congress. The irony is, of course, that January 6th was Charles Sumner's uh, birthday. Uh, you, the, the, there is this, you know, attacking this building, Tom Davis, it, it's got a lot of significance. Right. I don't think it's been attacked since the British. We've had shootings before, you know, which have been one-offs with people trying to get in. We lost a couple of police officers, uh, you know, a, a little, a couple of decades ago in a shooting, but we've never seen anything like this. It's always been respected. And the Capitol Police, uh, I don't think they've been a docile group. They're now professionally trained in the like. There just weren't enough of them, given the tens of thousands of people that came on the Capitol. And then you had a few unruly people just broke their way in. And... Uh, and came in and started to do damage. I, I've got to say that Charles Sumner was probably a lost on the person with the Confederate flag. I don't think he probably understood that or put that together. Um, but look, you've got to come down hard on this kind of thing. This can't happen again. And I think the president uh, has to bear responsibility for starting this. The president has to bear responsibility. Absolutely. He's the one who, who he was in, insightful in his remarks. I think, uh, look, I'm a Republican, but I think we also know when you win and lose elections, that's the way we settle things in this country, not by riots. We came down hard on the riots uh, this summer. We were coming down hard on the rioters here. They were lawbreakers. They were insurrectionists. I think they need to be punished. And uh, I, I think we will review now the Capitol Police, everything involved with this, make sure this doesn't happen again. President's paying a, a, a high price. I mean, this is his legacy as he leaves. And I think some of the good that, that was felt was accomplished, I think, gets lost in all of this. Sherry Berman, the Justice Department this Thursday saying they are going to pursue. Um, do you share Tom Davis's surprise as to what happened on Wednesday? So I think much less than um, Congressman Davis does. I mean, President Trump um, and a variety of other Republicans have been egging on supporters for some time now, trying to convince them that this election was stolen, that Democrats and others were lying to them, had cheated, had tried to undermine American democracy, and had encouraged them to engage in all kinds of activities, including coming to the Capitol. While obviously it was impossible to see what the precise end game would be, that people should be surprised that there were large numbers of folks out there who were willing to see the actions that were taking place yesterday, the counting of the Electoral College votes as illegitimate, um, should not have surprised anyone, and that many of these people were prepared to engage in insurrectionary and even violent action also should not be surprising. Freely available on Facebook and other media where people discussing bringing weapons and other kinds of, um, you know, uh, preparations for armed force to the Capitol. So I think there's a lot of questions going on here, but whether or not Trump and other Republicans should be seen as responsible on some level for this, I think is just simply indisputable. And the uh, social media you talk about, and Facebook, Twitter, uh, who've now suspended uh, the president, the outgoing president's accounts, your reaction to that? Well, I mean, we have free speech um, laws in this country, but we also have very clear dividing lines between what speech is and inciting violence. And there's simply no doubt that what Trump was doing yesterday was egging people on. And even after the rioting had begun, his comments were not at all consistent with trying to bring this to a rapid um, and peaceful end. So I think suspending him yesterday was definitely the right thing to do. And insofar as he continues to try to convince people that an election was stolen, he should not be allowed to make those comments. Twitter and Facebook are allowed to make the rules that they want to make. And he's denying some basic facts, facts that we now know have led to um, violence and sedition. And I think that at this point, um, you know, he has to be limited in the damage that he can do before January 20th.
Yeah, the, the outgoing U.S. president uh, who uh, this Thursday earlier sent missives through an AIDS account. And there, too, we got more mixed messages, like in his video message from Wednesday. This was during the rioting. This was a fraudulent election, but we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. I know how you feel. But go home and go home in peace. Yasha Monk, what was your reaction when you heard that? Of a very long pattern of, uh, on the one hand, seeming to condemn groups like that, and on the other hand, giving them a lot of uh, reaffirmation and uh, literally love, saying, you know, we love you. Uh, you're very special people. Let go home. Um, and understandably, or unsurprisingly, um, many of these insurrectionists then took that as permission to actually keep doing uh, what they were doing. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, to, to come back to the question of whether this was surprising, look, the particular form that this took was surprising. And the failure to safeguard the, the, the capital uh, during a protest which had been planned and denounced, and which wasn't, after all, uh, sort of, 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 of historic proportions. There was tens of thousands of people, but Washington, D.C. has seen that before. That, that failure, I think, was, was surprising. Um, but this moment is also, in one sense, inevitable. Um, you know, to Donald Trump, he and he alone truly represents the American people. That has been his way of talking and his way of thinking about politics, like many other authoritarian populists around the world, uh, from the very beginning. This is what has set him up for conflict with democratic institutions again and again over the last four or five years, when he simply was not willing to accept that there might be any uh, constitutional limits on his power. And it is also what explains why he simply cannot accept the outcome of the election. If you truly believe that you are speaking for the American people, then any election in which you don't win a majority of a popular vote, like in 2016, or in which you also lose the Electoral College in 2020, must be illegitimate. And the best explanation is simply that it was uh, stolen and taken away from you. So I think, you know, what we're seeing here is the end game of uh, populists being elected to office. And it is, by the way, the most positive possible end game you could have. Because in lots of other countries where similar politicians have come to office, they have actually managed to subvert the election to such an extent that they can't be removed from office by democratic means. But there's still 13 more days to go. When we come back, we're going to be asking about moves that are afoot on Capitol Hill to have Trump leave early. Stay with us. It's the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're asking about the potential lasting scars from uh, Wednesday's storming of the U.S. Capitol during the certification of Joe Biden's election of victory. We're talking about it uh, with our Washington correspondent, Kedivan Gorgistani. Joining us from the Washington suburb uh, of Vienna, Virginia, is former Republican Congressman uh, Tom Davis. And from New York, Sherry Berman, professor of political science at Barnard College, the author of Democracy and Dictatorship in Europe. Uh, and uh, from Jacksonville, Florida, Yasha Monk, your uh, latest book, Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and uh, How to Save It. Yeah, after uh, Wednesday's storming of the Capitol, Congress did reconvene in the night. And we saw what was appeared to be a rare moment of bipartisanship, senators reversing their earlier pledges to defy the results in Georgia. Mr. President, prior to the actions and events of today, we did, but following the events of today, it appears that some senators have withdrawn their objection. But then came objections over Pennsylvania, where still 138 Republican members of the House of Representatives voted to decertify uh, the result. Uh, my, my first question to you, Tom Davis, is 138. Uh, we, we've lost the connection there with Tom Davis, so we'll, we'll try to, to reconnect. Um, 
I'll put it to you, Sherry Berman, 138 Republicans uh, in the House of Representatives who still, after that rioting and ransacking, uh, were contesting the uh, votes. Uh, what was your reaction to that? My reaction was just shame and disbelief, frankly, because there is no empirical evidence whatsoever that there was fraud on a scale that would change the outcome of this election. And doing this kind of thing, especially after the rioting and sedition that had just happened, seemed to me irresponsible, really almost beyond belief. It was simply encouraging people to continue to believe something that is incorrect, namely that there was massive electoral fraud, that the outcome of this election is in doubt, and that these kinds of actions could be justified under any circumstances. So I really feel complete shame and disbelief that so many Republicans in Congress would engage in this kind of behavior, even if many of them cynically knew that it would not affect the outcome to do so and thereby indirectly encourage a belief among a significant sector of the population that this election was in doubt is just is really just remarkable. And indeed, immediate surveys afterwards show that a lot of Republicans do, in fact, believe that there was fraud, even after the rioting, and that these riots, in fact, may indeed have been justified. So this is extremely dangerous, extremely shameful, and a really very, very sad commentary on the state of American politics. Uh, Yasha Monk, uh, the credibility of the system, is it broken for good? No, I don't think the credibility of the system is broken for good, and it is important to underline the way in which uh, it did end up working. I mean, despite the fact that we have a sitting president who is uh, unwilling to accept the outcome of a free and fair election, and despite his attempts to intimidate uh, local election officials, despite his attempts to corral his own party into decertifying these results, um, uh, you know, his own vice president yesterday uh, publicly stated that Joe Biden is legitimately elected president of the United States. The last procedural hurdle to the uh, handover of power has been uh, accomplished. And even if Donald Trump were to claim that he is still the commander in chief on January 21st, 2021, I think there's no doubt at all uh, that uh, uh, the army, the armed forces, uh, civil servants, um, other federal officials uh, would listen to the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden, who will have taken office by then. Um, at the same time, it is very clear that much of the sheen of the system has come off, that some of the things that we assumed would never be in doubt um, uh, have now quite effectively been doubted, um, that we cannot be sure that uh, congressmen and senators can do their job in peace, um, uh, but actually that there can be an insurrectory mob who forces them to flee for a few hours, that you can have a sitting president refuse to accept the outcome of this uh, uh, free and fair election um, and uh, undermine trust in the system in that way. So it is damaged. Uh, we will be dealing with the after effects of this for many years, but that's not a reason to say that the system has entirely failed. Again, compared to many other countries, uh, it is actually remarkable the extent to which it has held up um, in the face of we are a, a determined authoritarian president. And Kedavon Gorgistani, that brings to the order of uh, the day, or should I say the hour, what with the news cycle changing so fast where you are. Uh, uh, Democratic congressmen uh, who've now filed articles of impeachment. We saw one Republican lawmaker uh, talk about evoking um, the uh, 25th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which would temporarily remove the sitting president uh, from uh, office. Uh, wh how does it stand as we speak? Well, uh, these are uh, very uh, strong positions uh, that are coming out of uh, the Capitol uh, from uh, both uh, Democrats and, as you mentioned, uh, at least one uh, Republican. Uh, but the, the question is, where can that go? Uh, let's start with the uh, impeachment uh, filing. Uh, the impeachment, as uh, we've seen very uh, not such a long time ago, uh, takes a lot of time. 
so uh, we have less than two weeks left before Inauguration Day and before Donald Trump uh, leaves office. So uh, this impeachment process uh, seems uh, very uh, symbolic in the sense that, uh, yes, uh, the Democrats can say that they have filed impeachment, but uh, how uh, that will uh, play along, especially uh, with uh, the situation in Congress where you still have uh, more than 100 uh, lawmakers uh, who are uh, supporting uh, Donald Trump, who are still objecting to those results, who are still talking about a fraud, uh, they will likely not go along with that impeachment. So uh, that seems like it's uh, dead on arrival, pretty much. As for uh, the 25th Amendment, uh, there has been some talk, there has been some reporting from U.S. media uh, that there are certain members of the cabinet who are discussing this possibility of uh, invoking the 25th Amendment. Uh, but as we heard earlier uh, in the show, there was this report explaining how uh, that would work. So you would have uh, to have a majority of cabinet members uh, and the vice president uh, sending a letter uh, to Congress, uh, to the House Speaker and the Senate Majority Leader uh, invoking the 25th Amendment. Donald Trump would be able uh, to rebuke that with a letter, and then they would have to send yet another letter, and then you would have uh, to have a vote. That also uh, would take quite a bit of time. And then there is uh, the little caveat, and uh, that hasn't been really settled, is uh, the fact that uh, the cabinet right now has quite a few members that are acting secretaries, and there is a debate legally as to whether an acting secretary even has uh, the authority to participate in that invocation of uh, the 25th Amendment. But the simple fact that you have a Republican coming out publicly and invoke and saying that we should invoke the 25th Amendment is in itself a, a, a huge uh, deal. And we'll see how that develops. But uh, it seems like there's not enough time for that to really play out till the end. Sherry Berman, do you tell yourself, oh, it's only 13 more days. We can just wait. Well, I mean, there is something to that. And I'd like to get back to some of the comments that um, my colleague Yasha made before, which I think are very important to heed, which is that we are in a very sad period for American democracy. Um, this was a very, again, sort of shameful act, not just the storming, but the willingness of so many Republicans to support Trump's claims of electoral fraud. But, but everything else, perhaps with the exception of the Capitol Police, did work as it should have. In other countries, this kind of rioting and insurrection might have had even more serious qualities. The danger of keeping Trump in office for the next couple of weeks is not that he will overthrow democracy, not that we will have an actual coup, but simply the danger of him wrecking further damage on American society and America's faith in our institutions. So I'm not worried about American democracy not being here by January 20th, but I think at this point, symbolically making clear that he has crossed many lines and that he should not also be allowed to hold public office, which is a somewhat separate issue, public office in the future, that might indeed be salutary, but, um, but at this point, I think we just want to count down those days until January 20th and hope that some degree of normalcy can return to American society and the American political system. Uh, so Donald Trump, from what you're saying, and I'll put it to Yasha Monk, is, is not going away. Uh, he's been the business model for many a news channel these past four years, Yasha Monk. Uh, what, whether you whether your political leaning was for or against him, talking about Donald Trump uh, drew attention. And uh, it's going to continue now as we head into the territory of what his supporters do, whether there are lawsuits, whether he's there are criminal charges. Again, will U.S. democracy come out weaker or stronger from all this? Uh, well, let me first of all echo an important point that uh, Sherry Berman made, which is, uh, look, we, we have survived uh, a dangerous, irresponsible president of the United States for four years. I think we can survive him for 13 more days. Um, uh, I cannot wait for the moment that he leaves that office, that he no longer has uh, all that power and that nuclear arsenal at his disposal. Um, I see the case for uh, trying to remove him because of uh, the symbolism that would come with uh, uh, him having been censored in that rare way. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, it would be very difficult to accomplish. It is very unlikely that there would be uh, a very broad bipartisan majority for any way of doing this. Even if it is done, it will be done on a you know very narrow basis with a few Republicans who somehow switch sides. Um, and I think it would unnecessarily create a martyr out of him. It would, in the eyes of many of his most hardened supporters, uh, support the narrative uh, that uh, the establishment in the deep state always wanted to get rid of him, that they never really gave him a chance, and that even on the way out, um, they had to uh, impeach him or invoke the 25th Amendment in some kind of unprecedented way um, in order to get him out of the door and to sort of uh, you know, complete the stealing of the, the supposed stealing of the election. I think it is, makes much more sense for that terrible, sad, ridiculous violence of yesterday to be Donald Trump's legacy and for him to uh, leave office as a, a weakened political figure who lost a political election, who was such a sore loser that he could not accept its outcome and who was flushed out by the political system in accordance with rules and procedures that we have obeyed in this country for 250 years. Yeah, except, um, but but again, a lot can happen in 13 days. Uh, Kedavon Gorgistani, on Tuesday, uh, you were covering the Senate races. You were in Atlanta, Georgia, those Senate runoffs. That seems like ancient history now. And looking ahead, a lot can happen. In particular, people are wondering about whether we'll see more presidential pardons, including people are asking, could Trump pardon himself? Yes, that's a conversation that had been going on several weeks, even before all the events of this week that feel like events of a whole month. But the question of pardons, and we've seen Donald Trump already handing out a few pardons, and there was a couple of weeks ago talk about the president looking into pardoning members of his family, like his daughter Ivanka or his son Don Jr., and there was the question that had arised here in uh, Washington uh, that, well, why would he be considering uh, pardoning his children uh, on what uh, grounds or for what crimes that he thought they might uh, be uh, prosecuted or uh, investigated for. So that was one uh, one question about uh, his immediate family. Uh, there were there was talk also of uh, him pardoning some of his uh, allies uh, like uh, Rudy Giuliani. And then that question that you mentioned, uh, the fact that uh, according to some reports, uh, the president was considering and was looking into whether he could pardon himself. That has been uh, hotly debated whether the president even has the authority uh, to uh, pardon himself uh, in, uh, in the constitutional, the legal uh, pr perspective of it. Uh, the other thing to remember is that, let's say he can. He pardons uh, himself preemptively. He pardons his family, his allies preemptively. That still doesn't protect him from some of uh, the uh, investigations and the, the lawsuits uh, that are uh, state uh, lawsuits. I'm thinking, of course, of uh, what is going on in New York. Uh, the uh, pardons only uh, work on federal uh, accusations and uh, charges. And so uh, that doesn't mean that Donald Pr Trump will be uh, shielded uh, from uh, any legal challenges. All right. And we're seeing a lot of reactions from European leaders after what happened uh, Wednesday, expressing their solidarity with lawmakers. And we're hearing stronger and stronger language denouncing Donald Trump himself, including from the UK Prime Minister. He encouraged people to uh, storm the, the Capitol, and insofar as the, uh, the president consistently has cast doubt on uh, the outcome of a free and fair election, I, I believe that that was completely wrong. I think what President Trump has uh, been saying about that has been uh, completely wrong, and I, and I un unreservedly uh, condemn uh, encouraging people to behave in the disgraceful way uh, that they did in the Capitol. Yasha Monk, your reaction? Well, it is interesting that many uh, political leaders, both in the United States and around the world, who clearly saw a strategic use in uh, appearing to be close to Donald Trump, uh, in part because, uh, you know, if you are the Chancellor of Germany or the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, you have to have um, a good working relationship with the President of the United States insofar as possible. And so 
I think it's perfectly honorable that Angela Merkel bit her tongue and um, you know, didn't go on random uh, diatribes uh, against Donald Trump. That was in the interest of, of her country and indeed in the interest of keeping uh, uh, many of the values she cares about um, going in these four years. Um, but there were also others like Boris Johnson who flirted with Donald Trump much more strongly, um, who wanted to be seen in, in certain ways as being close to him, um, uh, perhaps as part of the same uh, political wave. Um, and it is very interesting uh, to see them uh, uh, hastily trying to uh, leave the ship in the last days. I think that uh, is one of the signs that um, uh, you know Donald Trump is uh, more and more diminished by the day. Um, uh, his power is running out. He will no longer have any power in about 10 or 12 days. His social media accounts are being blocked, at least for now. Um, it, it may turn out, and uh, I, I have no confidence about this, but it may turn out that uh, he actually um, dominates the headlines less and uh, forces us to think about him less once he's left office than many of us now assume, and that would certainly be the best possible outcome for, for the country and for the world. Sherry Berman, will there be lasting damage to the reputation of the United States? Well, I can't imagine that there wouldn't be. I mean, four years of this um, lunacy certainly has to take its toll. Um, people will obviously recognize something that's important and may perhaps be valuable, which is that democracy is very fragile, um, that we can't take it for granted, even in places like the United States, where it's existed for hundreds of years and was seen to be relatively safe. Um, that may actually be a salutary effect, but there's simply no doubt that recognition that the United States has the ability to elect a person like this, has the ability to have one of its major political parties encourage such illiberal, anti-democratic, and even violent action, surely that will give people around the world and leaders of various countries pause when dealing with the United States in the future. I share with Yasha Monk, however, the hope that with Biden, um, not that we will have a rapid return to normalcy, but some of the damage will begin to be corrected, both at home and abroad, and that the United States might once again be seen as on balance a force for good, on balance, um, a force for um, democracy, and on balance, a force that um, makes the world a better place rather than a worse one. Yeah, but we, it seems to be a seesaw ride taking an increasing toll, Sherry. Uh, here in France, huge sympathy with the United States after the attacks of 9-11. Then the invasion of Iraq, that turns on a dime. Then the election of Barack Obama. Now this. Again, you piece it all together, there's this feeling the U.S. isn't as exceptional as it once thought it was. Well, that may very well be true. And again, to um, get back to the main point of this conversation, um, on the level of democracy, what we've seen is that even the United States has a lot of work to do to shore up its democratic system. So on that sense, no, the United States is not unique. It has its problems. And it has to work constantly to make sure that its population um, and its political institutions are secure and um, well defended. So in that sense, no, the United States is not exceptional. It remains a powerful country, perhaps still the most powerful country in the world. And in that sense, its actions matter perhaps disproportionately. And on that level, getting the United States back to a place where we have responsible leadership that takes both domestic stability and contributing to international peace and security seriously, that would be obviously a giant step forward and hopefully improve the image of the United States abroad accordingly. Sherry Berman in New York City, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Yasha Munk in Jacksonville, Florida. France 24 correspondent Kedavon Gorgistani with continuing coverage uh, of events unfolding in the U.S. Capitol, Washington, D.C. We want to thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.